Well, welcome everybody. It's good to see you here at this um, webinar for Iceworms webinar this afternoon. Well, it's afternoon where, where we are here in, in Adelaide in South Australia. I'm uh, Trevor Piller, National Partnerships Manager for Iceworm, and um, I'll be chairing this afternoon. Today I'd like to um, introduce um, Professor Howard Fallowfield. Uh, Howard is a aqu aquatic micro microbial ecologist. He, his research is in the health aspects of water quality. His 25 years research experience in the UK and Australia, and he's a coordinator of research higher degrees at Flinders University. Uh, the great thing about Howard, knowing him for the last 15 years or so, is that he is both professional and personable. But on top of that, you get a researcher, an academic, and, and practical. The agenda for today is 15 minutes Professor Howard Fellowfield presentation, and then 15 minutes of Q&A for us all to, to have, a, have a question. But anyway, right for now, we're looking forward to what you've got to say, Howard, and um, can I um, uh, also ask that um, you start typing your questions as, as he's speaking, that'd be really good. All right, over to you, Howard. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Trevor, for the kind introduction, and thank you for Ice Warm for inviting me to do this uh, this seminar, uh, and also for the participants who are attending today. And what I want to do is just take you through uh, an overview of some 11 years' work at, worth of research that we've uh, been conducting at Flinders on community wastewater uh, reuse schemes and the adoption of high-rate algal ponds for rural wastewater treatment in uh, in South Australia. Uh, I was going to take you through uh, the, the problem of, uh, of, of rural wastewater treatment, the old solutions, issues and limitations, and then the new solution looking at, uh, at benefits. The problem is that we've got rural communities that are um, not really supported by uh, wastewater treatment infrastructure, not supported by major utilities, and it becomes a community issue about how you manage uh, wastewater for people living uh, out of urban centres. Uh, the traditional view has been, or the traditional route has been to uh, conduct on-site wastewater treatment so that you have, uh, the example here is a septic tank, so you have um, all the laundry waste, bathroom waste, toilet waste going into a septic tank in South Australia. It's a fairly standard design of uh, 3,000 litre uh, volume, 24-hour detention, and you get the benefit of suspended solids removal and BOD removal. But ultimately, you have to dispose of the liquid phase, and that traditionally has been on site via a, a, dispose, a, a soakage trench or a, a channel where you uh, dispose of the liquid into the backyard or into the garden. There are problems with uh, soakage trenches uh, where you've got clay soils with low permeability. You can get uh, pooling of the treated effluent, and that leads to a greater exposure of residents and adults and pets from potential pathogens. You've got to remember that one of the benefits of wastewater treatment is really trying to uh, separate uh, people from their effluent and reduce the fecal oral route of exposure to pathogens. And in the other side of the, the coin, if you have sandy soils and you have uh, very rapid per uh, permeability of these soils, then you've got the potential for groundwater contamination. And that's really a public health risk if you're relying on bore water for drinking water. And of course, if you have pooling on a clay soil and you get heavy rainfall, then you've got the potential for contaminated runoff to arrive in uh, rivers and streams. This is just a, a quick photograph of a soakage trench that has been uh, heavily trafficked and you can see the ponding of water and the problems of on-site uh, disposal of the treated liquid phase of effluent from septic tanks. The township that I'm going to be talking a bit about is uh, Kingston on Murray, which you can see here, which is right on the banks of the River Murray. And the problem there, of course, is if you get ponding and pooling of water and you get nitrogen and phosphorus runoff, then you've got the potential for the river to become contaminated and to lead to uh, cyanobacterial blooms and cyanobacterial toxin produ production. And this water is, of course, used for drinking water. In South Australia, we have, uh, since the 1960s, adopted this concept now of community wastewater management schemes, uh, formerly known as septic tank effluent disposal schemes. And in that system, we retain the septic tank in the backyard, but we sever the connection to the soakage trench, and we then take the liquid phase to centralised uh, lagoon systems. Uh, we get the benefit of solids removal in the septic tanks and BOD removal, but the the act of just transporting the liquid phase means that we can do that in smaller diameter pipe work, typically a 100 millimeter PVC pipe. We don't need manholes, we can do it with uh, inspection ports for, uh, for managing the system. And also we don't need, because again the liquid phase is only being transported, we don't need to have such steep um, slopes on the, on the pipe work. The problem with these systems is that the 
retention time, the recommended retention time is 66 days. And that equals time, equals a large, equals volume rather, equals a large surface area. So these systems tend to be very large because of that residence time. And these are a few pictures of systems up in the uh, Barossa Valley and round about the Adelaide uh, Hills. One of the problems with these, uh, these systems, which some of you may know as waste stabilization ponds, are that they're generally operated between 1.2 to 1.4 uh, meter deep. And in, that, in, that, in areas where we've got very large temperature fluctuations and very warm, hot summers, we will get thermal stratification. That is, we will get a very stable water body. And when you do depth, when you do depth analysis, so this is the surface, this is down to a, a meter deep in the lagoon, you can see that you do not get a very homogeneous reaction environment. You've got very great differences in temperature, dissolved oxygen pH through the depth of the pond, which makes understanding these systems and managing these systems rather difficult. The other problem is these systems are largely unmixed and you get problems of hydrodynamics in the system. So you'll get hydraulic short circuiting in this design where inlet water, if it's uh, less dense than the water in the lagoon, that is warmer, you'll get the surface water exit in the pond and it won't re be retained in the pond for the design uh, retention time. You may also get a recirculation in the pond, that is where the inlet hits this baffle wall and then recirculates back into the pond, which means then you've got a very inefficient pond because you've got pond volume not being involved in treatment. And then a lot of work that we did in the early 2000s demonstrated the importance of wind effects where you can get wind where in this direction would be delaying the inlet, uh, delaying the wastewater arriving at the inlet, at the outlet it would be pushing up towards the inlet and on the al alternate route you would get shorter retention times because the water is being blown effectively down the pond. So we looked at this and said is there an opportunity for high rate algal ponds and we see that now as a bit of the uh, new solution. So in the past we've had a, a lagoon which has been unmixed Certainly, people who've researched on waste stabilization ponds have thought about the aspect of putting in baffles to try and uh, improve the hydrodynamics, move towards a, a sort of plug flow to improve, say, pathogen removal. What we've also done, though, is incorporate the baffles, but also put in a very simple uh, paddle wheel. And most significantly, sorry, most significantly, these ponds are operated at a much shallower depth, 0.3 to 0.5. The paddle wheel is not there to aerate, it's merely there to keep the, sus the suspended solids which are predominantly algae in solution which produce the oxygen for uh, wastewater treatment and the paddle wheel is rotated about 12 rpm and there's a mean surface velocity of about 0.2 meters per second engendered in the pond. So the opportunity is to retain the, uh, the benefits of a septic tank, uh, the BOD and suspended solids removal and put a high rate algal pond rather than the large 66-day residence time uh, waste stabilization pond. The work we've been doing, for those of you who may not know where South Australia is, is in South Australia, large state here. And I'm sitting in Adelaide, and the research sites have been at Kingston on Murray and Lindock in South Australia. The Kingston on Murray project was uh, proposed at, in 2005, and construction of the system was, was performed in 2008. It's uh, a... Uh, you can see here the inlet system, the shallow lagoon with the paddle wheel and the paddle wheel being mixed by a 750 watt motor, uh, very low energy consumption. Uh, the pond is a, a, in this system is 250 square meters, it's geotextile and high density polyethylene lined. Uh, its channels were formed by uh, floating curtains made from the same uh, plastic liner if you like. Operational depth is, is variable for seasonal if you want seasonal depth variation and the wastewater is circulated about 0.2 meters per second. The most uh, significant part of this, or the most significant benefit of a high rate pond is that the residence time is between five and eight days, significantly less than the 66 days. And we have now built two of these at Kingston on Murray, and I'll talk a bit about that later in the talk. So the research component of this talk, we were asked by the Local Government Association of South Australia to show them, to do a comparative study on uh, the performance of a high rate pond relative to the old system of waste stabilization ponds. And we were asked to do it in two formats. Sorry, again, asked to do it in two formats. One, to take the septic tank effluent directly and replace the facultative pond with a high rate pond. And the second series of comparisons was to take the, waste, the, the septic tank effluent into a facultative pond and then into the high rate pond and thereby look at how the high rate pond would perform replacing the waste, the maturation ponds, the four maturation ponds at the end 
of the POM series. We made a comparison between a traditional system, which is out at Lindock in the Barossa Valley, with our new system at Kingston on Murray to demonstrate the performance of the high rate pond relative to the existing system. The system at Lindock was constructed in the 1970s, serves a population of about 1,800 people, and it has a, a, a faculty pond, two maturation ponds, and the residence time there is about 50, 52, 53 days in our estimation. One of the benefits we see from um, community wastewater management systems is when communities sign up to be part of these systems, they also sign up to septic tank management. So the septic tanks are pumped out every four years. This means that we get a very consistent effluent being delivered to our systems. And Kingston on Murray, Lindock, Kingston on Murray is the high rate pond system, Lindock, these are the, this is the influent coming into the pond systems from the septic tanks. And I think you'll agree it's a very consistent effluent considering they are separated by a couple of hundred kilometers. This is now looking at the performance of the high rate pond. And I'm not gonna make this a data rich presentation. It's just to give you an overview. This is where the high rate pond is receiving the effluent directly from the septic tanks. And you can see the key part to take from this is that the high rate pond is operating on a retention time of five days. The Lindock system is operating on a, on a um, faculty pond retention time of 30 days. And here are some of the removal rates of BOD, total inorganic nitrogen, phosphorus, and the log reduction values of E. coli, which are important for protection of public health when we're considering reuse water. And you can see the performance is very similar, but the res residence time is significantly reduced in the high rate pond. This again is where it's looking where the high rate pond is replacing the maturation ponds in the uh, in the community wastewater management series. Again, the high rate pond significantly reduced retention time compared to the waste stabilization pond system. And again, the performance in terms of BOD and total nitrogen removal is so much better, as is the reduction of E. coli in the wastewater. These data were then uh, independently validated by uh, Australian Centre for Water Quality uh, accredited lab. And we moved to an independent validation because we wanted to ensure that reuse of this water, which is, which is the ultimate disposal pathway, it will not adversely affect the public health. So we need to know how the system removes pathogenic bacteria, viruses, and protozoa. This was designed, this validation program was designed in consultation with our Department of Health, which um, uses guidelines, the Australian guidelines and guidelines that are consistent with the World Health Guidelines. We have 20 inlet samples, 20 outlet samples, conservatively done in the winter, and we look at 50 percentile values for the validation. Uh, one of the how, just just one, uh, one minute to go, one two minutes to go. Okay, with the uh, with this system, uh, we looked at uh, pathogenic viruses and uh, phages as model indicators. We modeled these, we validated these systems in series, and we looked at log reduction values in series. This was a challenge because we're about 500 kilometers round trip and it was done with uh, an art accredited lab SA water doing, the, doing our analysis and provide validation. The outcome of this is it was validated by the Department of Health and Aging as an alternate system for community wastewater management schemes and these, these, this validation is consistent across Australia. So now we have a program, we have a guideline value, a design guideline which will be promulgated by the local government association. Individual schemes will still have to be approved by the Department of Health and Aging, but a high rate algal pond now is acceptable for community wastewater management schemes in South Australia. Chronology to exceptions, it's been an 11 year journey to get these systems from research to implementation and to validation and acceptance as an alternate system for community wastewater management schemes. The benefits of these schemes, they use about 40 to 50% less surface area than traditional waste stabilization ponds. They can be in, then, therefore be employed in areas where previously we thought there was insufficient land for these uh, sustainable systems. They're, they are low energy systems compared to electromechanical aeration systems that are often used in small rural communities. They um, only use about, only require about 11 to 30% of the earthworks previously required for a lagoon system. And consequently, the construction costs are between 40 to 50% that of a previously conventional lagoon system. For rural communities, we also have a reduced loss of uh, water due to evaporation because of the reduced retention time. So there's more water available for beneficial reuse within the community. The water is used for woodlots, grapevines, recreational spaces, mining, firefighting, but also 
we could look for future beneficial uses. High rate algal ponds produce significant amounts of biosolids, which are rich in nutrients for uh, soil conditioning. They could be used for potential renewable energy via anaerobic digestion, and even for more high value crop irrigation for forage and renewable energy crops. This has attracted the interest of Melbourne Water, and uh, we built two systems, two systems for, the, for Melbourne Water in the Western Treatment Plant. These are again 250 uh, square meter high rate algal ponds. And Melbourne Water are interested from the point of view of production of biomass to make them more uh, self uh, sustaining in terms of electrical energy production. So the algae produced in these ponds could be uh, anaerobically digested, methane produced, and electricity generated from the, uh, the system. This is the future. But finish up the benefits of adopting high rate algal pond technology would be reduced capital costs, reduced operating costs compared to electromechanical systems, lower energy consumption and greenhouse gas emissions, reduced evaporative losses, and, and we may be able to do more, be more beneficial reuse both with the solids and with the liquid phase. And I'll leave the acknowledgements till later. Thank you very much. That's excellent. I wish you could hear the clapping, uh, Howard, uh, because it is a story which I've only heard once before, but I could hear it two or three more times. Um, it's it's stunning that table five days thirty days and the and the retention at times and the um, and the uh, chemicals uh, chemistry is a really stunning table. Not to mention that last uh, picture of the oval pond, uh, pond itself. Thanks so much, Howard. That's really good. We've got a number of questions coming through, um, so maybe we'll get stuck into those straight away. It's quite a large class. I've got to tell you that there's um, like New Zealand, Zimbabwe, Cambodia, Ghana, Canada, India, Laos, China. And all the states of Australia, so I won't, I won't, um, won't a ton, ton of people. So uh, let's get it kicking uh, first off. Then Ben uh, Neal from uh, Tasmanian Alkalo Alkaloids. A, a question to think about: PIE pharmaceuticals in the environment. What's what's your take on this as far as reuse? That's a more uh, general question. I mean that the the um, the, the position with these these uh, personal care and pharmaceutical uh, chemicals. Uh, whilst we can detect them in the environment, there's still a large question about the concentrations that they appear in the environment and the likelihood that they'll be bioactive within the environment when you reuse water. I think it's still an issue uh, that we need to do more research on, in, and you'd expect a researcher to say that, but to do more research on in terms of um, w whether they are whether they can be realistically considered as biologically active and causing uh, potential adverse uh, impacts. Certainly, we have evidence of impact on um, biota in receiving waterways, but I think the question is more about the potential public health impact to humans of reuse water. And again, it's an open question in, in all pond systems. Very little work has been done on either the old traditional waste stabilization pond system or the new high rate pond system. And we're just about to start that work now. I might have to cut in. We've got, we've got uh, 11 questions at this point in 15 minutes. So they're all going to be fa fairly uh, cut. Uh, one from Ghana, Krasbozi, Kujinga. What's the lifespan of the system with a high rate pump? What well, we've been operating that system now for almost uh, 10 years with the same motor and the same uh, paddle wheels. So uh, we haven't broken it yet is the, uh, is the message that I can have. And it's a, very, it's a very straightforward system in terms of a free running electric motor and a gearbox to, uh, to, to do the gear reduction for the paddle wheel speed. Yeah. Another one from Nanda Altavilla from uh, New South Wales DPI, Parramatta. Uh, how, do you have any data read the pathogen removal rate you can achieve a virus, bacteria, and crypto. Yeah, what we've what we've got there, and I, I was very quick with the data. What we've got there is the obviously the biggest concern is with uh, human pathogenic viruses, and we've met the requirements through the uh, log reduction value. Which in the winter, again, this is a conservative validation, worst case scenario for a natural uh, treatment system. We're getting over one log removal of viruses, and we'll get up to one one point five two log removals of bacteria. Yep, that's great. Rob Wilkie, I note your diagram on effluent, uh, pond depth versus pH and other items. Shows pH reduces with depth. Does this mean generally that water taken from all effluent ponds for irrigation will be better taken from the greater depths to obtain lower pH values? You could um, deduce that from that figure, but of course what happens is that's a, that's a, that's a condition when the pond is actually stratified. When you, after periods of very high winds, the pond will be completely mixed because stratification will break down. But work we did in the early 2000s showed that uh, stratification could last for 48 hours in some large systems. 
So the, the point I was making was it's a very variable reaction environment in the unmixed system, which makes it very difficult to understand and model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Catherine Brock from Tonkin uh, Consulting. How are population fluctuations and therefore seasonal changes in inflows able to be accounted for? Well, we're looking at... We're up to 15 questions. We've got 10 okay, questions. we've, we've looked at that and, and the option is for depth variation. So we can, we, we've now got the, the validation will take us from 0.3 to 0.5 uh, metre depth, and that could be varied with season, could be varied if, where we've got uh, holiday vacational, uh, vacation uh, requirements for increased population in short periods of time. It would be, it would be a depth variation that would, uh, would be the most efficient way of doing that rather than building second ponds. Yep. yep. Uh, Professor Ted Gardner, you may know Howard, I think. Uh, he's asking uh, how are the solids separated from the treated effluent? Thanks, Ted, for the question. Okay, that's a good question. In, in our system, it always goes for reuse, as I said, to uh, woodlots or in the Barossa Valley, for instance, it goes to viticulture. So some of the finest uh, red wine produced in the Barossa is actually irrigated by wastewater from these community towns. <laughs> And you can see the solids as being part of uh, a slow-release fertilizer. And in Australian soils where you've got uh, poor uh, inorganic car uh, organic carbon, you're short of organic carbon, then by adding the algal biomass, you're probably improving uh, soil fertility through slow-release carbon. A couple of questions from Alex Campbell. Could the system be applied in a developing country context? And secondly, does the treated wastewater require special handling for to safely reuse? Well, in the, um, in, the, in, the, in the developing country context, we're actually now uh, engaged in uh, looking at the application of the system in India, and we're looking at the application whereby we use solar PV to uh, power the paddle wheel so you don't need uh, to be connected to an online power supply. Uh, regarding the, the management of the wastewater, I think it's normal uh, personal protective equipment and being, uh, being aware that you are handling a water that will uh, contain or potentially contain some pathogenic uh, organisms. Santosh Pandey, well known uh, to myself and probably yourself, uh, Howard. Thanks, Santosh, for your question and uh, for your work in the groundwater um, um, schools that have been in the past. Are these HRAP work? Is it a HRAP work? Uh, does it work well at colder environment in, in Tassie? Um, you would be. You would be well. We've worked at, at Melbourne, and we do get seasonal variation, but not necessarily in performance in terms of things like nitrogen and BOD removal. Where you see the variation is actually if you're interested in producing biosolids to generate energy or do something with those biosolids. So we do know we get a fall off in uh, in in the Melbourne uh, climatic conditions uh, in the winter. Uh, one from Tanzania, Joseph Marimoto. I'd like to know how the system protects the groundwater systems. To, to safely from pollution? Well, in our, in our, it depends what you mean by that. In terms of the, the actual pond system in South Australia, it has to be lined. We have to line the ponds with a high density polyethylene liner to protect against groundwater contamination. And of course, you've got the same issue of, of ir irrigation, at, uh, whether you're irrigating with possible water or wastewater, you have to manage your irrigation so as not to over irrigate and have the potential to contaminate groundwater or even to start causing problems of salinity of soils. Now, one question here from Alamanda Madan Kumar, is the economics of the system scalable? Yeah, we, we believe so. That there's been some research systems that have been uh, developed in other countries that have gone to 25 acres in the, in the US. Uh, this is the first system that's gone through this uh, um, rigorous validation by an agency uh, rather than become a research, just, just be a research system. So we're really pleased that we've got it to the implementation scale and we think it is scalable. And from Joseph Wilrick, what is the cost if we'd like to have the system and the lifespan of the system? Ah, oh, that's a big question, the wide question. What's the whole cost of the system and what is the lifespan? Yeah. I, I can yeah. say I don't know. <laughs> well, <laughs> good answer, good, good answer, but that's fair. We're, we're still working through this and we have research going ongoing about how we would how we would cost it and how would we best produce a scalable system. What's the most okay. cost effective way? Sure thing, yeah. Tim Muster, nice work, Howard. A couple of questions. Are there other benefits such as minimisation of odours? And also, how often do you need to physically clear the algae? What's the process? Oh, well, uh, the, the, the odour process, we, we, it's a completely aerobic system. So we don't, we really do not get odours. I mean, we've been operating now for 10 years and PhD students who come out and work on the system expect to go to a smelly wastewater treatment plant. And that's certainly not the case. The algae, it's operated as a continuous system, Tim. So it's uh, in inflow, outflow, um, 
theoretical hydro retention time of five days. And we get very little sedimentation in the system because over the years it's been agreed that 0.2 meters per second gives you enough for energy to maintain the algal cells and the biomass in suspension so it doesn't sediment out in your high rate algal pond. Yeah. Uh, Manoj Shrestha, what species of algae are generally produced and what species of algae are efficient? Uh, I've given up looking at species of algae because we've found now that uh, the wheat, what I call the weed species turn up, they're things like Chlorella, Senodesmus and Kistrodesmus and all of them, what we're really interested in is the algal oxygen production and also the uptake of nitrogen and phosphorus as they grow. So basically we're fertilizing the algae, increasing their growth and in return they give us oxygen which the bacteria use to break down the organic carbon and they, they return the carbon dioxide back to the algae to help the algae grow. But thank you for your short answers, Howard. Appreciate that. Alex Campbell asks, how many square metres of land required for each cubic metre of uh, treatment capacity? Uh, we've probably worked on the basis of um, numbers of people. Uh, you know, people, we, we work on 140 litres per person per day in South Australia, and that comes down to somewhere between two and four square metres of pond area at 0.3 metre depth, roughly. One more from Catherine Brock at uh, Tonkins. Are there any special operator skills required in managing the algae? Does the algae need to be harvested at all? Not, not in our, uh, not in the, not in our experience at Kingston Murray. I mean, and, and the other systems operated community wastewater management schemes. Um, there has been some concern about irrigation, but I've not, we've not had any uh, any problems with irrigation blocking, etc. Yep. Yep. Well, I, I, we're just about near the end now. Uh, Nanda Altavilla asked, "Do you think that that these could be used at the end of an old trickling filter effluent to reduce the pathogens?" Well, oh, certainly. Yes, I mean, I think you need you, we, we, we need some pretreatment, and we're happy with the uh, the anaerobic pretreatment because that's one of the best outcomes of work that's been done by people like Duncan Mara looking at anaerobic pretreatment of domestic wastewater. Anaerobic ponds are the way to go, but biofilters could also be beneficial. I think we're just about there. Arif uh, Sudrajat has made a comment that probably others may want to join in with, and that is that would it would be possible to have some papers published or some direction links to papers after the uh, after the webinar. His connection wasn't that good, so is that that's probably possible? Do you think, Howard? Yep. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. We can uh, we can give papers that we presented at the uh, yeah. Leeds Wastewater Pond Technologies, which is where I direct people. IWA International Water Association has a wastewater pond technologies group, which I've. Uh, served on for a number of years and that's a great source of resource and, and publications we're right on 159 and the last comment from joseph marimoto he'd like to request time to be increased if possible actually i think he's probably saying something for all of us uh, who wish to have a have a question asked and, and a lot more from myself too but um not enough time need more time he learned a lot as uh, joseph said i think we're going to have to close it there nine countries um every state and territory in australia I Look, thanks for your participation. We're really uh, pleased with the um, with the uh, time together, and obviously we need, we need more time. It's, it's right on the uh, thirty minute mark now, so we're uh, we're going to close there. And a, a very big thank you to Howard for taking the time on this. It's a lifetime's work, obviously, but I uh, appreciate your effort in the time. Top of all the other stuff going on in your in your uh, research and in your life at uh, Flinders University. Thanks very much, Howard. Thanks everyone for joining us. See you, you again in the future. Yep. Bye. Bye. Thank you.